Hello, my name is Konrad Alexandrovich, and this video is entitled Psychophysical Strategies for Supporting Gender Diversity in Actor Training. I'm an associate professor at the Department of Theatre at UVic, where I teach acting through movement and physical theatre creation. I have a long background in dance as a performer and choreographer, and I gradually moved over into theatre, where I became a writer and director as well. I call myself a physical theatre maker. This video essay is about how, in practical terms, to counter gender-based discrimination in actor training, or to state it positively, how to support actors of diverse gender expression. When I say training, I don't just mean the classroom, but the whole set of learning experiences that are on offer in theater departments in post-secondary institutions. This includes, most particularly, the performance activity that theater departments present to the public. For the purposes of this discussion, it's important to reconfirm some key concepts and definitions, which have been traded in discourses such as feminist and queer studies since the late 1980s and early 1990s. As Simon Murray and John Keefe point out in Physical Theaters An Introduction, quote, the assumption that is central to most preoccupations with gender and sexuality is the differentiation between biological sex and the cultural construction that is gender. Unquote. The word sex to denote male and female perhaps produces some discomfort or confusion, and so the term gender seems to have been recruited to take its place, and so we speak of gender discrimination and gender parity, and yet gender, strictly speaking, really refers to the categories of masculine and feminine, which most specialists agree are culturally constructed. I suggest that this is still very much a foreign, even subversive notion in the popular consciousness. But it is generally understood that, as Ellen Diamond says in Unmaking Mimesis, Essays on Feminism and Theatre, quote, gender refers to the words, gestures, appearances, ideas, and behavior that dominant culture understands as indices of feminine or masculine, unquote. It is, of course, necessary to refer to the foundational work on this subject by the theorist and critic Judith Butler, who has pioneered theories of the way that gender is constructed, performed, and perpetuated. Her theories about gender constitution are particularly appropriate in terms of theater, whereby we can see that our own gender expression forms another kind of performance. In her groundbreaking essay, Performative Acts and Gender Constitution, an essay in phenomenology and feminist theory, she proposed that, quote, we consider gender as a corporeal style, an act, as it were, which is both intentional and performative, unquote. Butler dissects the unexamined social consent to act gender in collective environments as well as in the interior space of the psyche, such that they become naturalized, unquestioned, and invisible. Or, to put it, this into the vernacular speech of RuPaul, with an emphasis not surprisingly on how clothing contributes to this process, quote, Well, we're born naked and the rest is drag. Drag is whatever you wear, however you choose to represent yourself through clothing, unquote. Clothing, hair, mannerisms, attitudes, self-concepts, and behaviors. In performing gender, we become gender. Terms such as gender variance, gender dissidence, and gender nonconformity refer to the phenomenon of the disjunction between biological sex and gender, that is, feminine men and masculine women, and include people we may describe as transgender. It is useful to think of gender performance and even biological sex itself as categories on a series of continua, as Kinsey proposed we do in relation to sexual orientation. I'd like to make a number of points here about the way that this phenomenon applies to acting in theater. First, in a patriarchal culture, the bias against gender dissidence is magnified in the intense scrutiny that is placed on the performing body. Since the actor is always already an eroticized object in the gaze of the audience, she or he is required to purvey heteronormative gender performances in order to vindicate mainstream definitions of attractiveness, glamour, and success. For a kind of shorthand, we might say that the actors who play lead roles in the Hollywood TV and movie industries most successfully embody conventional ideas of masculine and feminine. Second, gender nonconformist narratives and characters are marginalized or erased because of their power to disturb destabilize and subvert dominant ideas about the ways that gender ought to cohere with sex. By means of this logic, actors whose biological sex and gender presentation are incongruent 
are superfluous. They have no stories to embody, because the only stories they could embody are proscribed according to the precepts of both heterosexism and psychological realism, which requires that one may only perform characters which we resemble, that actors essentially perform versions of themselves rather than becoming transformed into characters who may be vastly different from themselves. Sidebar here, this topic is full of complications and contradictions. For example, Boys Don't Cry was a hugely successful film, however, the star who won an Oscar for it was not a trans man. Third, and following from this, because of our profound fealty to realism in the marketplace of representations, we cannot imagine gender dissident performers playing roles to which they do not correspond point for point. To consider the truth of this, one need only imagine actors who do not present as conventionally masculine or feminine attempting the roles of Stanley Kowalski and Blanche Dubois, respectively, in A Streetcar Named Desire. Therefore, young actors in training who are unable to be consistently convincing in terms of gender performance are likely to be selected out of acting programs and casting procedures for the plays that form the seasons of most post-secondary theatre programs. Indeed, please refer to Kelsey and Alex's videos in this series for additional exploration of gender diversity as it pertains to acting training. Now, I'd like to talk about how certain physical approaches to acting training can work to support gender dissident actors, that is, by focusing on the body of the actor as the route to character development rather than the psyche of the individual. As a physical theater specialist, I have a particular investment in this pedagogical field, this writing with the body, because it offers a unique perspective on the way that gender is culturally constructed. As Simon Murray and John Keefe have written, quote, an understanding of gender as something made, mutable, produced, and performed through relationships of power is a particularly salient paradigm for physical theater practices to play with and to make strange, unquote. We may never know how much of human movement patterning is determined by corporeal differences that are hormonally or otherwise congenitally driven and therefore to some extent unavoidable. For example, one might argue that perhaps the different masses of the male and female body predispose male and female persons to certain neuromuscular patterns. However, I propose that much of what marks guy or girl movement is learned behavior. The following comments are based on years of observation in the classroom, many of which seem to be corroborated in the published work of various key pedagogues. Typically, masculine movement and gestures are marked by a squareness, directness, and lack of decoration that differentiate them from those that are considered feminine. Women are allowed greater fluidity and articulation in movement than men, whereas men tend to move with fewer moving parts, as it were. That this latter is central to the construction of feminine movement may be seen in the way that the limp wrist, that is, a marked articulation in this joint, has been identified with effeminacy in men and used to mock and revile it. In general, the cultural construction of the feminine body prescribes a narrow base while men tend to take up much more space in the width of their stances. All one has to do is to stand with one's legs wider than shoulder width to experience the psychic signifying that results. Women, unless they are being presented in an overtly sexual and or aggressive manner, do not stand like this. Men tend to take longer strides than women and to step with more weight. This is part of the way that they are given permission to take space and therefore feel entitled to it, whereas women require special permission and encouragement, as it were, to relate to space in the same way. Men feel comfortable initiating movement from the pelvis and from the chest, which for women is problematic. Pelvic and thoracic initiations signify sexual confidence and availability, which until very recently have been proscribed for most women. As voice specialist Patsy Roddenberg has written, quote, male communication habits revolve around taking up space, not giving in, standing feet apart, sitting legs open, chest open or puffed out, energy forward, probing, head held high, unquote. The great polymath and prime mover Rudolf Laban and those who worked with him and after him, such as Irmgard Barteniev and Warren Lamb, together devised the most thoroughgoing and comprehensive system that we know for describing, visualizing, interpreting, and documenting all the varieties of human movement. Laban Movement Analysis, or LMA, includes observations about the way that the body and its movement are gendered. If we understand how to produce masculine and feminine movement, then anyone, regardless of their position on the gender continuum, will be able to perform any part of either. 
LMA addresses itself to four broadly construed and overlapping categories, which are body, effort, shape, and space. One of the most evident of these overlaps is that between body and shape, and Laban identified certain radical shapes that the body is able to assume. Called the still forms, they are the wall, ball, pin, and screw. The wall is wide with a wide base and is inescapably masculine. Think of men in uniform in the military or police forces. When one vocalizes as a wall, it is almost impossible not to use a very deep, resonant chest voice. As mentioned earlier, the wall moves in masses with very little articulation. The pin is its gender opposite, thin and elongated with a narrow base, its tiny voice high in the head resonators, a woman in a hobble skirt and high heels. The screw is essentially a pin in a spiral and is, I suggest, also gendered as feminine, a fashion model lurching down the runway in that crossover gait that they use. It is also capable of an extreme degree of articulation, diametrically opposed in this regard to the wall. The ball, connoting age, among other things, tends to be genderless, which I find intriguing, as it seems to me that when we are either very young or very old, we are physically unable to perform gender, either because we have not yet learned it, or because infirmity tends to erase its features. Any acting student playing the still forms is, ipso facto, also playing gender. Therefore, gender becomes something we can detach from the self, hold up to the light, as it were, and manipulate like an object or like a piece of costume. And speaking of costume, one could in fact extend this exploration via an explicit use of clothing as the source of gender performance. Students could spend a week or so taking their regular classes dressed in clothing typically assigned to another sex. Men could wear wigs while women could either cut their hair or put it up in caps. Women could wear suit jackets and heavy shoes and add artificial facial hair while the men could wear skirts or dresses and high heels. As comical as this sounds, actors would discover, without engaging in any other consciously adopted changes in behavior, that simply by wearing the clothing and footwear of another sex and changing one's appearance concerning hair, that one goes a long way to achieving a variant gender performance. Laban's system comprehends and describes movement as behavior, which is why it is so widely utilized in theater pedagogy, integrated into classical approaches to acting technique, including Stanislavski-based work. As I stated earlier, contained within the edifice of concepts he established is the structural pillar called effort, for which he proposed four factors, namely flow, space, time, and weight. Each of these presides over a continuum of qualities. Flow operates between the poles of bound and free, forms the baseline of all movement expression, and is linked to emotion. Space, which may be either direct or indirect, is associated with attention. Time, from sustained to urgent, is about decision. And weight, which is manifested on a continuum from light to heavy, is associated with intention. The action drives, which are the most widely used components of Laban's system in acting pedagogy, are formulated from combining three of these elements, time, space, and weight. For example, a float which is light, indirect, and sustained embodies an easy, carefree state of mind. Change the weight factor to heavy and you get a ring, which expresses all kinds of contained emotional and physical distress that actors may be called upon to play. At the opposite end of the spectrum in terms of weight and time are slash, heavy weight, indirect space, and urgent time, and punch, whose space factor is direct. Both of these drives are synonymous with violent expressions. All of these categories operate in psychic as well as physical registers, or rather, the psychic and the physical are held to be synonymous. One is an expression of the other. One may easily see how the effort factors may be read in terms of conventional constructions of gender. Light weight is feminine, while heavy weight is masculine. Direct attention in space is masculine, while its opposite is feminine. As in the case of the still forms, all actors of all types and dispositions are able to engage in action drives that transform their gender denomination. Men may play soft and yielding qualities, while women may engage in actions that amount to violent combat. And these tools may be applied to the way that any piece of text is performed. The approach to text, and to performance in general, is via a set of technical procedures that unleash the imagination rather than via internal processes of the person.
Other physically-based approaches to acting training, such as the Michael Chekhov technique and the viewpoints method of improvisation, also consider the actor as a performer whose tasks are akin to those of a dancer or musician. The actor uses her body to play the score, which is the play, or however the performance text is constituted, but the actor is not the same as his character. And this observation leads me back to the point I made earlier, namely the way we think of the relationship of actor to role, given our investment in realism. This may be summed up by the term iconicity, that is, the expectation that the form of something and its meaning be identical. And it means that we require that actors be just like their characters. But in the terms of a wider view of what theatre has been and can be, realism is just one style among many. Central to Bertolt Brecht's innovations in the last century was the idea that audiences ought to reflect critically upon the meanings of performed narratives, and that in order for this to be possible, an actor had to narrate his or her part, that there is or can be a fundamental disjunction between actor and role. Brecht's conception of the Verfremdungseffekt, translated as alienation effect or A effect for short, can be of great value to those who want to destabilize and subvert conventional notions of gender. As Ellen Diamond has argued, gender in fact provides a perfect illustration of ideology at work since feminine or masculine behavior usually appears to be a natural and thus fixed and unalterable extension of biological sex. Feminist practice that seeks to expose or mock the strictures of gender usually uses some version of the Brechtian A effect." Unquote. And this is the subject of Laura's video talk in the series. We can't change the world, but we can change our small corner of it day by day in terms of how we present ourselves, what we model to our students and colleagues, and in terms of what we teach in the classroom. Thanks for watching.